Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome to another review. Up today I've got quite an interesting Great Western Steam Loco from Hornby. I really think that today's locomotive is a bit of a rarity. You've probably heard of the original Hornby 2800 class, it was a tender driven locomotive designed in the 1990s and Hornby made absolutely loads of them. They were in Hornby's range for well over 10 years and there's a very very good chance that you've seen one of them before. But did you know that since then Hornby have completely redesigned the 2800 class, they produced a new tooled version of it. Well I didn't until I bought this. So this is a modern Hornby 2800 class and I can only ever remember seeing these for sale brand new on one occasion and that was about five years ago and Hatton's had them in as sort of new old stock I believe. And the reason is that these were not produced for very long. I understand that these were introduced in 2010 and according to Hornby Guide, the last time these were in Hornby's range was 2011. So these models did not stick around for very long. I could be wrong about that because Hornby Guide isn't that reliable for modern locomotive releases. But like I say, I cannot remember seeing these for sale anywhere except for on that one occasion at Hatton's. So that's the reason I'm revisiting this loco today. I'm hoping to show you a locomotive that you might not have seen before and also perhaps drum up a little bit of interest around it which might maybe induce Hornby to re-release the model because I think it's well worth it. So I've got a couple of questions for you in the comments. First of all, were you aware of this version of the model? Let me know. And second of all, if Hornby were to bring this back, would you buy one? You might want to wait until you've seen the review to answer that, but keep those questions in mind as I do this review. So let's take a look at this. The example you can see here cost me just £91. I have no idea what the RRP was in 2010, 2011, but I think five years ago when Hatton's had them for sale, they were going for about £120, but I don't have any evidence of that, that's just from memory. So it seems quite reasonable, no doubt if they were re-released to date they'd be much more expensive than that, but nevertheless let's take a look at this model and see what it's like. Alright, so 2010-2011, really quite a good era for Hornby steam locomotives, so I'm very much looking forward to revisiting this one. Let me show you exactly what I've got though, so the product number for mine is R3106, it is a Great Western 280 class 28XX, and it's number 2807, and this is just a DCC ready locomotive. There's also a bit of history and info on the back of the box, so there you go, you can see this is classified E, that's the Great Western little classification. In the centre you've got a brief history of the locomotives in real life and I will give you a bit of history on those in a second because they are very interesting locos and there are a first for the railways in Britain which is quite interesting and then unfortunately no drawings this time. I do quite like looking at the diagrams that Hornby sometimes provide but on this occasion just an old photo. So yeah oh well never mind. I guess that means it's time to take a look at the model then. So let's take a fresh look at this thing. Here we go. All right, so this is a lovely 280 tender locomotive, quite a big beastie really. Okay, right, let's take a look then. I don't remember too much about the mechanism. It must have been a little while since I've serviced this one. Um, although I seem to remember it was okay, so that's a good sign. Anyway, so notice that these instructions are for the 2800 and also the 3800 class. Again, didn't realise they'd done a 3800 version, but apparently they did. Uh, in 2010 and 2011, they also had the 3800 too, which is definitely news to me, that's for sure. Anyway, inside, lubrication, very basic, just shows the axles basically. Fitting the accessories, we'll take a look at those in a second. Body removal, uh, yeah, I think it's just a couple of screws. Front pony's got to be removed to get to them. Coupling, assembly, etc., etc. Accessing the decoder. Doesn't show the chassis, does it? Uh, no, doesn't. Brake rods on the back. So you'll have to wait until later on to get a look at the chassis. But let's take a look at the loco then. Well, let's see what the accessories are like to start with. See what we've got in here. 
doesn't seem to be too hefty on the accessories. Looks as though we've got brake rigging for loco and tender. Actually functioning screw link couplings there. Uh, I think it's just one set, so perhaps either the loco or the tender's got them already. But that's a marvellous feature. Again, I say this on every review that I see these. A lot of modern Hornby locos do not include those. Painted pipes for the buffer beams as well, and also some painted cylinder drain cocks, which you can fit if you wish. So that's pretty decent, actually. Yeah, not bad. Now, let's take a look at the loco. I'm interested to revisit what the livery is like. And also a thing with the packaging. Look at this. Look at this for inefficiency. You've got small blocks of polystyrene which have been wrapped in tissue paper and then taped together. And this is what is used to protect the locomotive. So you've got some little man in a Chinese factory somewhere and his job was to wrap pieces of polystyrene in tissue paper and then <laughs> stick them on the inside of Hornby Loco packaging. And there's loads of these things. This must have taken an absolute age. Blimey. Anyway, <laughs> how's the finish? Um, not terrible. There's a bit of a satin sheen going on with the boiler work there, but yeah, it's definitely not the quality finish that you might expect to see on a modern loco. And I guess 2010, 2011, that's pretty much expected, isn't it? But let's lift it up. I've got to be careful with this because one thing you should know about this loco, this model, it's pretty fragile from Hornby. Uh, to say there's not that much sort of exterior separately fitted detail, they certainly do have a tendency to fall apart a little bit. And you'll see later on some of the repairs I've had to make. But anyway, yeah, this is a large locomotive and that definitely shows through in the weight. It is extremely weighty, the loco is. And that's surprising because the bodywork, so the boiler, the smoke box, the cab, everything, that is all made of plastic, as is the running plate. It is just a plastic running plate on this loco, yet it is incredibly, incredibly heavy. I don't know how they've done that. I'll have to put this on the scales and let you know exactly how heavy, but very, very heavy, that's for sure. And I love this class. It is absolutely gorgeous, isn't it? Uh, 280, quite an unusual wheel configuration for the Great Western. I can only think of maybe two or three classes that actually had this. And uh, it looks wonderful, particularly in the Great Western green. Uh, it's quite something, isn't it, to see a 280 freight locomotive in a livery other than just plain black. So this is something quite special, I think. And I will show you a lot of the details up close in just a second. But first of all, here's a bit of background on the 2800 class in real life. The Great Western 2800 or 28XX was a class of two-cylinder 280 steam locomotives designed by George Jackson Churchwood. These were intended for heavy freight use and the design could output a tractive effort of up to 160 kilonewtons, that was after some modifications, though at a slower speed than some engines, of course, due to the slightly smaller diameter of the driving wheels. In fact, this would be Britain's first 280 locomotive. I don't think I ever realised that. That first example, which was the first one, was built in 1903 as a prototype, which was subsequently improved over a couple of years before the main production run of a further 83 engines, which started a couple of years later, like I say, in 1905. The design would then remain largely unaltered until the mid-1940s, when the Second World War caused significant coal shortages, and in response to that, the Great Western converted 12 of these 2800 locomotives for oil firing. And these 12 were then reclassified or renumbered to the 4800 class, which displaced the existing 4800 tank engines, necessitating a change in their numbering to the 1400 series, as they are now very well known. Which is confusing, so thank you the GWR for doing that. Withdrawal then finally took place between 1958 and 1965, but a healthy six examples do remain under preservation. So there she is, up close and personal for you, the Hornby 2800 class. And as you can probably tell, this is a gorgeous, gorgeous locomotive. I really do love this thing. It's much better, much better than the old 1990s 2800 class far more refined as you'd probably expect and also of course much more detailed. 
It's really heavy as well. It weighs in at 351 grams. The old one, by the way, was heavier than that at 388 grams, although less of that weight was over the driving wheels on the old version. This one has more weight over the drivers because the Loco contains most of the weight and obviously it is Loco drive this time. Nevertheless, the Loco does suffer from a few poor design choices. I mean, it's a Hornby Loco, so I guess that makes sense. The first one is the decision to make the Loco body out of just plastic. So the bodywork, I guess that's fair enough, but this plastic running plate, I think you can probably guess what's wrong with it. Yet, unfortunately, it is warped. And it's not warped in the usual way where it sort of bows upwards at the end. It actually bows downwards in the centre by, well, I don't know, a, a maybe half a millimetre or so. And of course, over 10 years on, Hornby are still guilty of this with a lot of their new models. The A22 was definitely a good example. A lot of people had warped running plates with that. Although they are starting to learn the new A3s from Hornby, or A1s, depending on which one you got. Uh, they have been upgraded to have die-cast running plates. Frankly, something we need to see a lot more of, given how much Hornby are charging. But the warped running plate has a knock-on effect with this locomotive, and that is that the detailing around the centre of the running plate, where it's bowed downwards the most, doesn't fit correctly. So you can see these pipes uh, that lead down from the safety valves, they don't reach the running plate anymore. <laughs> this confused me for a long time before I realised that it had a warped running plate, but the same is true on both sides. Yes, the pipework does not reach the locating holes. And the reverser rod also doesn't fit properly. In fact, when I first got the Loco, it kept dropping off. And again, I didn't realize the running plate was warped. So I ended up just sort of bodily gluing it into roughly the right position. So the decision to make the running plate plastic has had a seriously detrimental effect to this Loco, unfortunately. The second design, well, it's not really a, a mistake as such, but it's not the way I would have done it. And that relates to the visible chassis block, which is just in front of the firebox here. And then you can actually visibly see one of the gear shafts. Now, this is not the way that locomotives or models are designed these days. So I guess this is a mark of the Loco's age. But if I remember correctly, the entire mechanism is housed between this part of the visible chassis and the cab. I'm pretty sure the motor is housed within this area as well. Now, you can see why they wanted to do that, because that means the underside of the boiler can be perfectly realistic. And indeed it is, there is no sort of join underneath the boiler. But what it does mean is that the size of the motor that you use has to fit into such a small space. And as we're going to see later on when we look at the mechanism, that has meant that a smaller and more puny motor has had to be used. These days, when a loco like this is designed, it's only really the gear train that is hidden in this area. What they would do is split the bottom of the boiler and then house the motor in the boiler itself, where there's loads and loads of space. And then the chassis would just be designed so that there's a gap in it, so that you've still got an, a relatively, relatively realistic underside of the boiler. Uh, but yeah, more crucially, you don't have the visible chassis block and the motor can be larger and more powerful. Something that uh, was not done with this Loco. But besides that, I think that's pretty much it for the downsides. Otherwise, it's a lovely, lovely engine. So let's start by talking about the boiler because it is fully realistic all the way around. Yes, on the bottom, as I've said, but also on the top. For a 10 or more year old locomotive, no parting line across the top of the body. There is a seam on the top of the boiler, but that, as you can clearly see, is intentional. That's part of the model, part of the molding. So that is really quite marvelous. The decoration is very simple on this locomotive, but what is here has been done well. So you've got the running number on the side of the cab, just a tampo print, no separately fitted etched plates available with this. That's a shame, but I guess fair enough. And on closer inspection, you can see this weird scratching around it. I don't know what's happened there. It must have been something to do with the manufacturing process, but you can only see it from some angles. I mean, if I turn it away, it kind of disappears. <laughs> it's a weird optical illusion. Very strange. And then the finish on the bodywork is okay. Yeah, it's not the most satin in the world, but it's not completely flat either. So I guess it's all right. Buffer beams separately painted as well with the running numbers on board. And of course you have got these metal separately fitted sprung buffers. Yeah, sprung buffers, very nice indeed. And of course you've got the option to fit the screw link couplings and also the other buffer beam details if you want to. 
There's also a separately painted safety valve bonnet, which I think is also separately fitted. Just plastic, unfortunately. Again, if it was done today, maybe they would have electroplated that and made it look better. But the molding is certainly all right on there. And while we're at it, the whistles, I believe, are just made of plastic. Uh, but they do look good, I must say. They're very, very cleanly molded, aren't they? And they're certainly painted well, so that's great. The front of the smoke box looks good as well. It incorporates the handrail into it very nicely. And the smoke box handle itself is separately fitted and also very sturdy, maybe even made of wire. But it looks good, nice and straight. Another absolutely astonishing feature is the detail between the frames. This is really, really well done. It's part of the chassis, I believe, this detail. You can see all the rods and the linkage and such. Yeah, it looks really, really impressive and it definitely catches the eye as the Loco runs along. The running plate is extremely well detailed. This is a big difference between this and the 1990s 2800. As you can see, this has the full riveting and such. And around the front, you've got a representation of some lamp irons as well. The wheels are quite good too. You've got the fully molded plastic centers, which allows them to be quite realistic. And then relatively fine looking coupling and connecting rods, as well as the whole crosshead area here, which all looks fine. You've got some separately fitted and separately painted pipework underneath the cab area. The cab itself has nice flush glazing, which all looks great. Separately fitted tender full plate as well, which is a nice feature, although this one doesn't pivot, so it's kind of stuck at an awkward angle. And the very exposed cab area is fully detailed. You've got loads of detail in here. You've got a separately fitted regulator rod. You can see the reverser and the brake. The water gauges actually have transparent acrylic on them so that they look realistic. And all of the gauges are painted as well. It really, really is a strong cab. Again, this would rival what Hornby are producing today over 10 years on. <laughs> it's quite, quite something, isn't it? And I think that pretty much does it for the Loco. I guess I'll show you the wire handrails, which are very, very fine on this. So apart from the couple of design choices, which are just silly in my opinion, the Loco itself is not far from modern standards, is it? And for £91, I was very, very pleased with this. The tender, again, is a really nice job. Nicely detailed body with the great Western lettering on it and also lots of rivets, of course. Decent underframe, nice depiction of the axle boxes and the springs and such. And of course, you've got the option to fit the brake rigging there if you want to. The underframe is complete with a very fine looking water scoop, which is great. The front end of the tender is very, very well detailed. You can see we've got all of these controls which are separately fitted and such. The coal load is also removable, I understand, but uh, it's quite a, a stiff fit, so I'm not gonna try and prise it out, but it looks good, good and realistic. And then around the back, you've got more separately fitted handrails, lamp brackets, and another suitably detailed buffer beam, although only one set of screw link couplings was included. That's a bit strange, isn't it? Surely you'd want to. And sure enough, we don't already have one fitted to the Loco. So not sure, I guess they don't intend you to fit one on the back because it would interfere with the tender coupling. Still would have been nice to have the option. There is a tension lock coupling provided though, which pivots very slightly. Okay, so there you go. That is the level of detail. Overall, a beautiful, beautiful Loco. I do think if Hornby were to bring this back with a few upgrades, particularly to the decoration, this would be an absolutely gorgeous loco and as long as they didn't rip you off with it as they probably would this would be a very very sound purchase wouldn't it but we haven't talked about the performance yet so i'm going to take another look at the mechanism we're going to get this down onto the track and see what kind of performance this lovely old girl can give so there she is then down onto the track ready for her run and I am looking forward to this because this is not a loco that I use very often. So it's going to be awesome just to get this thing running and have a bit of a session with her. For, sorry, that came across weird. Didn't mean it like that. Um, anyway, mechanism. Let's talk about that first. So pickup situation is fantastic. We've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 wheels picking up on this model. That is awesome. So all of the tender wheels have pickups on them. That's great. All of the loco wheels have pickups on them too. So continuity with the track is never going to be a problem. That's great. The drawbar is the standard Hornby drawbar design, which is absolutely fine. It's not the nicest design in the world, but it works, same as usual. 
The base keeper, as you'd fully expect, is held on with some screws, and it is hardwired technically, but it's hardwired in such a way that you can easily move the base keeper plate away for servicing purposes, and it still gives you full access to the axles, so no problem at all, that's fine. It's a bit of a weird design, this, because the bearings are not deeply set into the chassis, as you'd usually expect. They're kind of perched onto the top. I'm guessing they've done this so that the base keeper plate, or the base of the loco, is at the correct height. But it makes me wonder whether the axles are perfectly supported or not. Probably though, because once the base keeper plate is on, uh, they're not going anywhere. So, yeah, it's just an observation, really. So here's a look at the chassis, which is the most interesting aspect of the mechanism. And you can see what I was saying about the motor and the gear train. You can see how compact it is in order to fit into the firebox area. And you can also see the boiler a bit better now. You can see how complete it is all the way around. Obviously though, there are some downsides to this. It's meant that this much smaller and poor running, really, motor has had to be used. And there's also no room for a flywheel. However, you can also see that the boiler has been filled with a metal weight, which is where a lot of this Locos weight comes from, and it's just the perfect spot as well, right over the driving wheels. So there are definitely pros and cons with that design, because a motor in that space instead obviously wouldn't have been as heavy. Gauging then came in at 14.1 to 14.2, which is a little bit loose, a little bit below the standard. I guess they've done that because of the large wheelbase of this as a 280, just probably allows it to take curves a little bit better. And from memory, I think it does pretty well. So let's try the performance. The motor, by the way, is a five pole motor, uh, but it's obviously not as good as the much larger and beefier type that uh, Hornby use in some more of their locos that are this sort of size. So does the loco still work? Yes, it does, because I've just tested it, but here it is for you. And I have to say, the performance is a mixed bag. The low speed is not great, and that's a pity, because this is a freight loco. But at the higher speeds, the speed is very sensible, it's not too fast. It's geared realistically, given that this is a freight locomotive, so that's good. And uh, it does not slow down or anything on curbs or anything like that. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. But yeah. Good talk, good everything, except for the slow speed. And I guess we'll get this over with. I uh, don't know why. don't know why this motor can perform well, and it does in some locos. But for whatever reason, in this case, it's just a bit of a juddery mess. No flywheel either. Let's see if I can get that to happen. I'm turning it up slowly. There we go. <laughs> that is literally about as slow as this can go. I've now let go of the controller. Oh, I need to turn it up a bit. <laughs> So that's a pity, isn't it? Really, a freight locomotive is going to be coupling up to wagons really carefully and such. It would have been nice and it would have been handy to have had this loco capable of doing a much smoother job than this. And how is it in reverse? Easing it up. Uh, similar, maybe slightly better in reverse, but similar. So I don't know if that's just a quirk with my example. Perhaps others ran better but uh, this is the only one I've got to go on, so it is what it is. Bit disappointing, but like I say, at the higher speeds, it's better. It does seem to lurch a little bit at the higher speeds. Um, yeah, it seems to almost jump around. Uh, it's hard to capture on camera. In fact, I seem to remember it doesn't really come across on camera, but yeah, it, just, it just seems to gallop almost. It's really weird. But apart from that, yeah, it's, it's all right as a performer. The pulling power is all right as well. It comes in at 0.38 newtons, which is about 24 coaches on straight and level track. That's more or less what you'd expect of a loco of this size. It's about the same as a Hornby 8F. So to test the pulling power, I've hooked up a load of wagons, quite a good number, I would say a good 20 odd there. And uh, if she can haul these around the layout, then hopefully that's a good demonstration that this loco has decent torque. So let's go and couple to them. I don't promise it's going to be smooth, but I'll try and do it as gently as possible. Okay. Okay. There we go. Bit of a trouble with the coupling there, but... Yeah, I think it's done it. Okay, let's set this to 50 then, and you'll see just how sensibly geared this is. There you go, and as you can see, it's not that fast. I think for heavy freight, maybe that's a little bit fast for my taste, but if I set it down to 40 or 30, it's still very nice and smooth, so more or less, it's completely fit for purpose. It does beg the question as to why it's so coggy at the slow speed, you know, if the gearing's good. Uh, I don't know, it's probably just the motor. 
uh, couldn't say. Anyway, here's the 1990s 2800. Thought it would be rude not to run this one. Oh, <laughs> bit of a fluctuation in speed. But yeah, talked quite a bit about it, so it seems an obvious choice. And then on the inside line, I'm running what I think is one of the few other Great Western 280s I've got. There is the um, that ROD one, so that's one, and I think there is that Helgen Night Owl thing as well, which I don't have, but uh, yeah, there's that too. So not that many 280s really from the Great Western, just a, a small handful, if anything. And my 90s one is struggling there, I'll have to go and give it a push. But I'll sort that out, let's take a look at the latest Hornby one. And don't forget to keep an eye on the sidings, see which other 280s you can spot, and if you see an odd one out, comment down below and I will pin the first correct answer. Anyway, this is perfectly fine. Very, I didn't see any slowing down on the curve there, which is good. This one's having to go a lot faster now in order to make it up the other side because it's got a ring filled motor, an original one, mind. But yeah, the new Hornby one, it certainly performs better than the old tender driven ring field one. So that's great. And uh, so apart from the crawl, the performance is really quite solid. The fact that it's got decent torque is a really big selling point for me. I think that's really important for a 280. And at least it's smooth at the higher speeds. So generally, this is a great loco, isn't it, really? The level of detail is fantastic. The performance is not the greatest, definitely. Don't, don't sort of misunderstand. But overall, it does what it's supposed to. And because this was quite inexpensive, like less than £100 when I bought it, I've never had much of a cause for complaint with this. So it's a gorgeous loco. If you can find one, I would definitely recommend it. Let's have some ratings then for the very, very lovely, actually, Great Western 2800 from Hornby, the new one, of course. A level of detail I've given four and a half star. For me, this is very nearly a five because there's loads of detail on this, sprung buffers, full valve gear between the frames, and seriously, one of the best cabs I've ever seen. But you have got that bit of visible chassis block in view and I don't think it would be right to give five stars to this on detail with something like that. So it loses half a star. Besides that, fantastic level of detail. Performance for me gets just a three star because it doesn't have that quality performance that you'd expect from a premium locomotive. Having said that, to be fair, at the higher speeds it is perfectly smooth, it doesn't slow down on the curves, seems to be plenty of torque, it's just quite coggy and not very smooth at the low speeds and that's kind of critical for a freight locomotive so it loses a couple of marks for that but apart from that yeah the performance is okay the pulling power 24 coaches that's kind of what you'd expect it's about the same as the hornby 8f even though this is quite a lot heavier than the hornby 8f so not ultra impressive but not really a problem i don't think the mechanism, again, is really quite strong. I've given it a four star on mechanism. Uh, I think it needs a better motor, really. That would allow it to do the better slow speeds. And perhaps a flywheel would be nice as well. Uh, but overall, still quite a good mechanism. All of those pickups, proper bearings, nice and serviceable. Yeah, can't really go too far wrong with this on mechanism. The quality, though, does lose a couple of marks because I did find a couple of issues. First of all, plastic construction. Models always lose at least one star for that for me. But this one loses a second star for that because some of the detailing on the running plate doesn't fit as a result of the warping, as a result of it being made of plastic. So yeah, slight quality issue, nothing too major, but I can definitely see this putting you off from a model like this. Value for money though, I paid £91 for mine and at the retailers I'm sure it was being sold for around £120. Now that's an old price, yeah it's outdated, if Hornby brought it back now would they be available for £120? I'd be very surprised. But of course I can't mark it down for that sort of speculation so it does get 5 star on value. Overall then that is 7.74 out of 10, a very good score actually overall. Let's put that into the ranking and it is in 10th place above the upgraded A1 and below the Atlas GP40. Bear in mind its position in this ranking is slightly inflated due to the old price but obviously can't mark it down for something that it hasn't done. So overall very very good. Well folks, that will just about do it for this review. I hope you enjoyed it, I certainly did. It's a wonderful little model to revisit. And I just have to hope that Hornby decide to bring this back. Hopefully the tools are still around. Uh, hopefully they can still produce it at a reasonable price. 
possibly even with some upgrades and then I could perhaps understand it being a bit more expensive if that's what they wanted to do but I just hope that we will see this model again someday uh, it would be sad to think uh, that it was released just for a couple of years and then never saw the light of day again so hopefully that won't happen but uh, I think that's about it for this review so thanks for watching do comment down below would you buy one of these if it was made available <laughs> and uh, if a lot of people say yes then hopefully someone from Hornby will see and maybe do it that would be awesome but for now thanks for watching folks i'll see you very soon you take care catch you on the next one all right cheers everybody